be turning to Matthew chapter 5 this evening, Matthew chapter 5. Are there any hymn requests for next Sunday night before we jump into the Word? Benjamin. When I surveyed the wondrous cross, 252. 252. Got it. Two more. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ben. All people that on earth do dwell, number one. Number one. One more, unless Ben wants to go three for three. <laughs> All right, well, if you think of one, you can find me like we normally do. Wow. Good thing the cap is on. All right, Matthew 5. Let's look at, towards the end of the chapter... Last two beatitudes, no, not beatitudes, last two antitheses this evening. Matthew 5, beginning of verse 38. God's word says, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, or your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you. Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your enemy, love your neighbor, and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we have read these words tonight, these are challenging words. These are difficult words to hear, and they cry for wisdom to know how to understand and obey them. And yet your word is simple, and we must not overly complicate it or in any way take away from the power of your word. So help us to do that tonight. Help me in the reading and now the preaching of this word to set forth your truth. And help us as your people, as your kingdom citizens, to hear these words and to delight in them. To continue to remember the needs we mentioned tonight that are so serious. Remember also my friends Chris and Lisa Dean, both in the hospital with COVID. Be pleased to bring them through and to please spare them and to bring them out. There are many needs before us. And you alone can bear these burdens and do your will and do what is great. So do that, we pray. And help us to find comfort and help in your word tonight. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come tonight to the last two of the six antitheses here in the Sermon on the Mount. And these are probably the most difficult. And what makes them so difficult is as I explain what Jesus is saying in these verses, you are probably going to ask, yeah, but what about... Often, In other words, when we look at what the Savior is saying and what he is putting before us, we may wonder, but, but how does that apply to this? And But what about this? And are you saying this? And the problem is, I can't answer all those questions tonight. One, we don't have enough time. The sermon would double or triple in length. Two, I don't think I have the wisdom to answer every application question that could possibly come from this passage. And third, and this is probably the biggest reason, what you never want to do when you preach a passage that's challenging is take the teeth out of it. In other words, you don't want to read a passage and then say, now this passage isn't saying this. And you spend so much time saying what the passage isn't saying that the passage gets a little opportunity to actually say what it's saying. And our job as preachers and Christians is to let the Bible speak. So I'm going to do my best to explain what Jesus says. And what you can do is listen and ask yourself the question, all right, 
how can I apply the Savior's words in my life, in whatever situation I may be, in my context right now, how can I go out and how can I apply what our Lord says to my life? So let's start then with the first antithesis, of verse, verses 38 to 42, which deals with the topic of retribution. Jesus says in verse 38, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Now, Jesus is here citing the Old Testament. Again, Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, Deuteronomy 19. They all lay down what we call the lex talionis, or the law of retaliation. And one commentator notes that the law of Moses, like other ancient and modern law codes, regulated the extent of retributive punishment. The principle of retribution was accepted, but it must be proportionate to the offense. In other words, the purpose of language like eye for eye and tooth for tooth is to say, if you commit this crime and it has perhaps this effect on another person, then the retribution you will receive from the law will be equal to the crime you committed or to the effect of that crime on another person. We see it in the Old Testament, and we even see it throughout ancient law codes. There's even a sense in which modern law codes are informed by this principle of retribution. The punishment must fit the crime. Now, sometimes when people come to this phrase in the Old Testament, they actually try to interpret it in a merciful way, as if to say, well, the Old Testament's goal was to actually limit retribution, to keep you from going over the top and excessively punishing people for crime. So think of what we might hear of tales from the medieval ages. If, if you steal bread, you get your hand chopped off. Well, obviously, losing a hand is far greater than the crime of stealing bread. If you're familiar with the story of Les Miserables, the main character uh, in that story, he is sentenced to 19, Jean Valjean, he's sentenced to 19 years in prison because he breaks a window pane to steal a loaf of bread for a starving family and when he's in prison, he tries to run away. 19 years for what we would say is a petty crime that could be easily fixed with a small monetary fee. Maybe the Bible is just trying to keep those situations from developing. The problem with that interpretation is in Deuteronomy 19.21, where this principle is laid down, it leads with the words, show no pity. If there is an eye, then an eye must be given, and on and on and on. So it sounds like in the Old Testament, it's trying to avoid overly soft penalties for various crimes. Furthermore, in Jesus' time, as this law was handed down and interpreted and implied, many of these physical retributions had been replaced by financial compensation and even somewhat appropriate financial compensation. So I don't think we can say, hey, things have just gotten out of hand and the Old Testament was trying to limit it or Jesus was trying to limit it because that would just basically leave the Old Testament prohibition or provision in place. And again, Jesus' goal is somewhat twofold. Yes, he wants to strip away tradition. Yes, he wants to strip away abuse of the Old Testament law. But he doesn't just leave it there and say, okay, now go back to doing the Old Testament. He doesn't come to abolish it, but he comes to fulfill it. He comes to show where it was always pointing and the bigger principles that should govern his kingdom citizens. So that comes into play then in verse 39, where Jesus says, But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Retribution is accepted by the Old Testament. But the question Jesus asks us, is retribution necessary? In other words, in place of making sure that you get appropriate compensation when you are personally wronged, Jesus declares the principle of non-retaliation. Do not resist an evil person. Now, when you read the word resist, you may think, okay, Jesus is saying I must be utterly passive if there is anyone who comes against me. And perhaps the, the follow-up language of turning the other cheek seems to reinforce this. I'm not going to go that far to say that Jesus prohibits any kind of avoiding a dangerous situation, getting away 
from any kind of oppression, and here's why. When we hear the word resist, uh, we might think just simply you don't withstand the action. But one of the definitions offered for this word in the standard Greek dictionary is this. Set oneself against or oppose. And you can see how that's a little bit stronger, isn't it? Jesus is not saying one must be utterly passive. However, he says when you are wrong, don't set yourself in opposition to them, especially on the ground of personal slights. In other words, don't seek personal revenge, but rather leave vengeance to God. Some have even tried to view this as Jesus making a direct comment on resistance movements in his day, such as the zealots, whom we've discussed before. They were more like the terrorists. They just blow everything up, and that's how we'll get back to uh, having our own land. And perhaps Jesus is saying, don't throw in your lot with that. That might be overly specific, but you get the idea of what he's getting at here. You're not to set yourself in opposition and resist in that way when you are personally wrong. And he gives them four examples to clarify exactly what he means and how we might obey him. Let's go through those really quick. First, he says at the end of verse 39, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, again, this is the most likely example to make us think you to stand there and take it no matter what's going on. In the original context, to slap another person's cheek was a very serious insult, and there was, e there was even legal redress that you could claim if someone slapped you on the cheek. That's not only in Israel's legal code, that's in the Code of Hammurabi. When you learn ancient world history, that usually comes up as a well-known legal code. And the penalties for slapping someone on the cheek, well, that could range from a small fine to cutting off an ear, depending on the social standing of the two parties involved. Keep in mind, by the way, most people are right-handed. So if they slap you on the right cheek, that means that it's a backhanded slap, which is far more insulting and far more degrading. And again, the Jewish law code at least allowed double damages should someone do that to you. So here's my point. Getting slapped on the cheek is not just getting beat up. That is a matter of honor. Your honor has been slighted. And in that culture, honor requires the appropriate recompense. I mean, that came down way into society. Think of the founding father, Alexander Hamilton, got killed in a dual rod. Why? You preserve your honor when someone calls you out. That came out in the Middle Ages, and it had roots even long before that. Jesus says this. It is different with my people. You can forego the financial benefit that you're entitled to should someone slap you on the cheek. You could accept that insult without responding and without seeking retribution and even offer the, less, the left cheek for a further, although ironically less serious in that culture, insult. Now when we start preaching this way, and this is going to happen all throughout this passage, People are like, you, you can't live like that. That's impossible. Hey, we say that now. This culture took honor and shame far more seriously than ours. We think it's hard to obey now. Imagine trying to obey it in the culture in which Jesus lived. It would have been a paradoxical, paradoxical utterly humiliating demand that the Savior gives here. And he's not done. He goes on, verse 40. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Now, here's what's interesting about this provision. If you're familiar with the Old Testament law, you know that on the one hand, it prohibits the taking of the outer garment. If you loan someone your outer garment as a pledge, it had to be returned to you before the night. A lot of people slept in those, and it kept you Warm. So interestingly, while you may have legal rights in reference to a shirt in the eyes of the Jewish law court, there's no question about forfeiting your coat. Ironically, the Old Testament wouldn't let you do that on humanitarian grounds. So by the way, when we say, oh, that Old Testament so barbaric. Uh, it's more humane on this particular example than what Jesus appears to be saying. But here's what I think Jesus is getting at. Let's say you got a poor person. He's got two basic forms of dress. He's got a shirt. He has a cloak. 
He goes into a Jewish law court where it's okay to give away the shirt, but the law won't let you give away your coat. And what does he do? He gives shirt and coat, essentially leaving himself naked. What does he do? He is mocking the justice of the court. Not in a rebellious way, not in a look at me way, but in just a way of saying, this court, at the end of the day, can never hand down perfect justice. What God wants and what God demands and what generosity and, and humility looks like in the kingdom of God, it goes even beyond the court. So just take it. Why? Because this disciple can go out knowing, I will trust God to provide. I am not dependent on this court at the end of the day to meet my need. And my priorities as a kingdom citizen are not just in getting what rights I have and getting what's coming to me, but in living for the kingdom of God and pursuing his ethics and living for his gospel and not getting bogged down in those kinds of things. Let me give you the last two quickly. Verse 41, if anyone uh, forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Now this reflects a very specific situation in which a Roman soldier could conscript Jewish civilians to carry their heavy packs. And the law allowed them to do so for up to a mile. It was an oppressive practice, deeply resented by the native Palestinians. Think in our own American culture. We have the Third Amendment, which prohibits soldiers from being quartered in your house without provision. She was on the other uh, permission. She was on the other foot. In the Jewish culture, the Roman law actually allowed the soldier to compel the Jews to carry their pack and to go one mile. Jesus says, not only should you accept that imposition, you should volunteer for a double stint. And again, that would have been remarkable in his culture just to do it for someone else, but utterly unheard of to do it for the enemy. So I want you to think about what Jesus has already said. He's already offended the zealots because he's saying don't resist. Now he's even going to offend just the ordinarily patriotic population by telling him to submit to these un unreasonable, oppressive rules. And then finally, he says in verse 42, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Jesus gives the principle of unbridled generosity to always be ready to give and to help those who are in need. And as we know from other passages, that doesn't always come with asking questions or wondering where it goes, but just helping those who have needs. Now again, you give these principles, you read these verses, and all we can think is, how is this possible? I mean, just on the last one alone, I'm going to run out of money pretty soon if I actually follow the principles Jesus is getting. What about people who abuse others, who turn the other cheek? Abuse in homes, abuse in government. What about our responsibility to denounce oppression when it hurts other people? I'm not denying any of those. But like I said, I can't give all of the but what abouts. All I can say is what drives Jesus's words here? And it seems Jesus wants to make this point. In the kingdom of heaven, self-interest does not rule. That is not the number one priority. Even our legitimate legal rights, even our legitimate expectations, they give way to the interests of others and to the priorities of God's kingdom. Jesus gives ideals that portray an unselfish and uncalculating benevolence, which thinks only of the other's needs or desires and doesn't think about protecting one's own resources or one's own honor. Now, what we're tempted to do, as I've already said, is to say, okay, well, in this situation, it wouldn't apply. Or, this, you know, this rule would trump this rule, so you don't have to worry about it. But again, Jesus was used to that kind of reasoning. That's what the Jews had done to God's law. They had a casuistry, a, a set of rules that at the end of the day domesticated the law. And Jesus says, I want to do the complete opposite. I don't want to give you a law. So, uh, here's just a new set of laws. Now go out and domesticate it. Jesus says, I want to give you a greater righteousness, greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, a, a new way of living as the people of God. And so that's why I just say, just read the verses, go home, read them tonight, read them this week in your devotions, and just ask yourself, okay, God, you show me. How do I apply this in my life, in my family, in my school, in my work? in whatever way would be glorifying 
to you. How do I apply my church? Remember, kingdom of heaven, church. That's the number one application. Jesus doesn't give us a charter where we can then necessarily go reform all political institutions on these grounds. It starts with the church. So how can we live it out? Any application, if it is true to Jesus' teaching, will represent an essentially non-self-centered approach to ethics, which will put the interests of others before my personal rights or convenience. That's the gist of what Jesus is getting at here. So let's come to the second section then. Love in verses 43 to 47. Jesus says in verse 43, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, again, go read the Old Testament. I'll save you the time. You won't find the command to hate your enemy in the Old Testament. That's why we say on one level, Jesus is stripping away the Pharisaical traditions. He's freeing the law from those traditions. But he's not leaving it there. He's also showing us where the law was pointing in a way that might not have been crystal clear thus far. Hence his words in verse 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So in the Old Testament law, when it says love your neighbor as yourself, in that passage you find references to your kin and one of your people. And so for that reason, the Israelites had developed a tradition of reading the verse as only commanding love for one's fellow people. And after the Charlottesville uh, events of a few years ago, a news station organized one of the KKK leaders that was involved and said, well, well what about love? And he cited that verse from Leviticus and said, see, it only says love your own people. So I only have to love my own people group and not people like you he said to the person giving the interview. Well, that kind of interpretation is found in some of the Jewish records. Neighbor is interpreted merely as fellow Israelite. Well, what about this idea of hating their enemies? Well, where would they get that? Well, some passages in the law call for the benevolent treatment of a personal enemy. Some passages in the law, and I'll give you the references if you want them, called for a welcoming attitude to disposed or displaced foreigners. However, the Old Testament also, of course, has the story of God giving the promised land to the Israelites and they drive out the Canaanite people. Different uh, issues, the Jericho, walls of Jericho falling down and those people being put to death. There are verses in the Bible that talk about God's hatred of his enemies. And so those kind of combine to make the Jews feel like, you know what, we, we might have a patriotic duty here to hate those who oppress us. And so that's what Jesus is turning on his head, stripping away that, that bad interpretation and saying, you, you know where God's law was always pointing? It wasn't pointing within this community. It was pointing out. And so I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Why well, mention prayer? Well, it's kind of hard to pray for someone you don't like, isn't it? Unless you're praying in precatory prayers, I guess you could do that. But when you're praying for someone, that, that in and of itself is an expression of goodwill. I would think this would also include like we see Stephen doing and Jesus on the cross doing, praying for these people to be forgiven. For someone like a Saul of Tarsus to see the light and to be converted. Jesus says... You should love your enemies, and you should pray for them. Side note, by the way, because I think it's important to mention this when love comes up. How does Jesus talk to the Pharisees? He talks to them very robustly. So let's not make the sentimental application that love means I'll never say anything that's difficult for another person to hear. That love means merely being nice to people and not letting error go unchallenged. Love is not, in is not incompatible with controversy and rebuke. But the position Jesus is taking here towards his enemies is one in which we must remember that love and forgiveness must reign. In verse 45, he says, if you love them, you will be children of your Father in heaven. You won't become his children, but it will be the outworking of that relationship. Those who are already his children, the peacemakers, its legitimacy will be seen here in our actions, like father, like son, 
so to speak. And the example Jesus gives is how he gives sun and rain on the evil and the good. When it comes to just generally doing good, God doesn't play favorites. He shows mercy to all. And of course, Jesus concludes with an application that's very easy to understand. It's, it's natural to love your own people. It's natural to love those who love you. Jesus calls for something unnatural that transcends what humans can do. Leading to this conclusion, verse 48, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word perfect means complete, unblemished, blameless. It's the idea of maturity. This is what perfect love looks like. So how do we plug that into our understanding as Christians who live by the gospel? Well, on the one hand, Jesus does give us ideals that we can never keep. This word perfect means what it says. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. No one in this room will get close to that. It's an ideal we can't keep. The proper response to such an idea is to repent, to acknowledge before God our sins of not keeping his laws and his commands, and not to in any way turn this law into something where we could walk out of this room tonight saying, yeah, I think I got that down pretty good. None of us should be able to say that before God's law. However, like all of God's laws, this is meant to be kept. It is a rule of life for those who are forgiven and who have the Spirit. In God's eyes, he will accept you as perfect, as having perfectly kept these because of Christ. But that doesn't mean that the Spirit doesn't change our hearts, and we strive to be in practice what we already are in position. And when we so strive, our lifestyle as Jesus' disciples will be different from other people's. It will draw its norms not from society, but from the character of God. And let me make these final observations and suggestions for application. As I've already said, these are hard to do today. They were even harder in Jesus' day. Nonetheless, I don't think we'll find that they are in any way irrelevant today. They are very relevant to our situation, are they not? We live in a day in which there are ongoing discussions about government rules, health concerns, how to navigate the different rights of different groups of people that may be in our society. These ideas will tell us, as Christians, how we can live in the midst of all that. They won't necessarily fix all those authorities, but they will guide you in how you as a Christian can live in the midst of those situations. So I would tell you they're very relevant. This, this is what guidance we need. Today. Secondly, I would tell you they can be applied. Don't get distracted by the ideal. And don't please get distracted by hypothetical applications. I have a friend one time who he had been reading these verses. He was challenged. He tried to talk to his dad about it. And so his dad said, okay, so the next guy who knocks on her front door and says, give me your house, you're just going to let him have the keys of the house. Well, what are we doing there? We're, we're presenting this extreme situation as a way of undercutting what Jesus says. Okay. I don't know if that's the right application, but I have to do what Jesus says. So if somebody knocks on my door tonight and asks for the house, I'll say, give me a week so I can pray about whether or not to give away the church's house. And I'll let you know next Sunday what I decide. Here's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, we could, we could run down the road with all those hypothetical questions. And, and, and the end result will be we're not going to apply it very well. Because we're going to get so tied up in that, we miss what Jesus is saying. This can be applied. Let me give you just one. The next time there's a dispute in your family, I know parents, you don't do that, but the next time your kids do that, or maybe parents, if you do that, and you feel in that moment, I've got to be right. I think you need to ask yourself that question. What, what's driving that attitude right there? Do I have to be right? What about my rights? Think about what Jesus says next time those situations come up. And try to apply it in your life. In order to help you do that, I would just give you these three questions. And I'm just going to read them, not develop them. Next time you're wronged, next time you feel the squeeze in a situation like this, just ask these three questions. When you are wronged, 
Are you more fixated on being justified and recompensed or on forgiveness? More fixated on being justified, being recompensed, or on forgiveness? Two, when others impose on you, are you more concerned about your rights and resources or on being generous and showing faith in God and the priority of his kingdom? And third, when others aggravate and oppose you, are you more interested in the principles they are violating? These people just don't get it. Are you more interested in making sure that's clear or on loving and doing good to them? We could all do well to ask ourselves those questions. And to remember this gospel application, someone had to live out these ideals. And that was the Lord Jesus, who actually did turn the other cheek gave his back to the smiters, didn't resist the oppressor, loved his enemies so that he could die for us, we're the enemies, and reconcile us to himself. So let's give thanks to God for that saving work. Let's pray for God's help. Lord God in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus always tells us the truth. Lord, forgive us of where we have sinned against these commands. And Lord, forgive us where we think we've started to keep them and then been proud because other people don't. God, forgive us of all rebellion, hard-heartedness, self-righteousness, smugness. And God, root all those things out of these hearts. And help us to truly delight and love what Jesus says. And however we are to apply it as your people, as a church, just give us that wisdom, we ask. And help us to go out doing that for your glory. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude then with him 600. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. Him 600. Stand with me.
and go, friends, with God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you.